Um, so first off, I'd just like to thank um, all the organizers, uh, Dr. Mercedes, for putting together such a, a great group of talks. Uh, we already saw some really, a really diversity of talks about diversity, and I'm, uh, I'm really honored and excited to be here and chat a little bit about my research today. Um, so I'm going to switch things up a little bit in, when we talk about the controls on diversity, uh, and I'm going to do this two ways. So the first is I'm going to talk about diversity with respect to functional diversity. Um, so moving beyond species and talking about how can we look at the controls on other types of diversity in these systems. Um, and also I'm going to move beyond looking at just a community and take uh, a much broader scale lens of diversity to try to understand how diversity shifts as we move across scales. Um, so let's think about this idea of community assembly so we can take this island and really what we're asking about is giving a snapshot of who's there. Can we try to make some inference about the mechanisms that gave rise to that or given just a bare plot of ground, can we try to make some prediction about what types of processes will give rise to diversity in these systems. Um, and when we think of something like this, you know, you have seeds that disperse onto the island, they sprout as seedlings or, or if we're thinking through plants or trees and some die off because maybe it's too dry or hot and the rest are left there to compete and there's these various biotic processes that prune that, that system. Now, when we think of this lens of community assembly, I'm sure all of you are somewhat familiar with this type of um, toy diagram, but we often think of it through the idea of these two different filters. So there's an abiotic filter and this biotic filter. And we heard a little bit about that yesterday, talking about this environmental or habitat filtering. And generally what we're interested in is given this final community, can we try to infer something like the relative importance of these two filters? So there's a regional species pool, species that can survive in a given lo location sort of pass through the filter. Um, we have the local species pool that would be all the things that could get there and could survive if they're growing in isolation in monoculture. They then interact with each other in this biotic filter and some more species get excluded and we're left with the, the final abundance of species and some network of their interactions, how they relate to each other. Um, and I'm going to talk about today this biotic filter primarily through the lens of competition in part because when we're thinking of forests uh, they're really unique organisms, you know, they're very long lived and they're a really nice study system for looking at competition. It's not to say they don't have tons of other processes like herbivory and parasitism. Um, but again, on first approximation, competition is a really, uh, a really dominant structuring force in communities. So suppose we just go and we just take snapshots of all these communities. How can we sort of look back in time and try to infer what's going on um, historically in these systems? And the first idea for this was proposed about 25 years ago by Hern Keddy coined this term under dispersion or dispersion. Um, they were talking about it primarily through the lens of functional dispersion, uh, though now there's a lot of work also with phylogenetic dispersion. And this is my definition, not theirs, but it's, it's the extent to which the functional diversity of a community differs from that of the species pool. So essentially, it's not about whether something has high or low diversity per se, it's about how the diversity of a local community com compares to what could be there. And Vihar and Ketty put forth this really simple um, null hypothesis that when you have really high environmental adversity, so essentially suboptimal conditions, you should see this clustering, this homogenization of functional traits. Things should not only have low diversity, but that should be even lower than you would expect at random. We can sort of think of this if we think of something like the boreal forest, right? There's a lot of frost risk, um, wind risk. And if you're a tree that sticks out above the canopy, you're actually going to increase your risk of mortality. So even at the just the, the sort of maybe idiosyncratic assembly processes, we'll select for species that essentially don't st stick out in any way. There's this selection for, for similarity. Um, it could also just be due to the overarching importance of matching specific traits to specific microsite variables. You know, if it's stressful to begin with, you maybe can't survive unless you have exactly the right carbon or nitrogen ratio. So we're going to see this homogenization, presumably, in these systems. Um, at the other end, where we have an absence of envir environmental adversity, so essentially optimal conditions, this is where we would expect to see competition and other biotic processes really playing a, a strong role. Things like the, the principle of limiting similarity, minimization of niche overlap will presumably govern or, or drive these communities to be more diverse than you would otherwise get if you assembled them at random. So if we think of this through this, this null model, this little toy diagram, what we're really talking about here are the, the, how permissive and how restrictive these filters are. So in the first case, you have a very restrictive um, abiotic filter. So it's a really harsh environmental conditions. The only things that pass through are going to be very similar in terms of traits, or again, if we're thinking phylogeny, in terms of phylogeny. Um, 
And maybe there's some additional pruning due to competition, but in the end, the resulting community is going to be very, very similar. And so this would be called under dispersion, the diversity of this community relative to the diversity of the, the regional species pool. And it's often seen as a proxy for the importance of abiotic conditions. Conversely, when you have a very permissive abiotic filter, everything passes through. And then this very restrictive biotic filter, in part just due to the intensity of competition, weeds out many more species. And what we're left with are species that are functionally very, very different, very unique compared to if you sampled at random. Um, so part of what I'm going to talk, to talk about today is sort of through this idea of trying to disentangle biotic and abiotic processes. But for reasons I'll talk about a bit later, this can also be a little dubious. Um, there are multiple reasons why, for example, competition can cause things to look similar. But one thing we can take away from this just by looking at dispersion is the relative importance of this sort of core principle governing survival. Do species survive by being similar or dissimilar from each other? And I actually think this is sort of a powerful way of viewing the idea of coexistence and, and survival because it, it's right on the cusp of applied and theoretical, um, in part because this is something you could, you could sort of manage for or something you could measure. Um, it's really hard to go and you know, manage for something like, I don't know, like destability or something in these communities, but you certainly on first approximation could try to infer how if species or subsets of species could coexist if you understood the role of similarity and dissimilarity in, in really governing individual survival. Now, I, I'm, again, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this idea. However, at the same time, there's been relatively few um, really robust tests of the, the hypotheses put forth in Byher and Ketty, in part because their hypothesis is quite complex. They say in, really to, in order to really understand dispersion, you have to look at four things simultaneously. You can't just look at overall functional diversity. You really have to look at individual traits and, and try to understand what patterns they show, how these patterns vary across space, maybe within a habitat. Um, how does the size of the species pool, most importantly, the range of species that you consider, how does this affect this type of pattern? Um, at the most local scale, you're looking at sort of maybe true competition. As you zoom out, you're increasingly looking at evolutionary processes, biogeographical sorting that's governing how different species and different habitats relate to each other. And then lastly, are the patterns consistent or do they vary among habitats or across eco ecosystems or ecoregions? So um, a lot of people, me included, have done previous work with dispersion, but we tend to take a sort of fix the context. We say this study system in this location across these few plots, and then we say, do we see over or under dispersion? But really to, to address these hypotheses, we need to, to look at multiple things simultaneously. We need to look at different spatial scales, multiple habitats and multiple traits. Um, and this really precludes or, or is part of the reason why uh, this approach is used a little bit less in, in community ecology and coexistence theory because this is not something we tend to, to get. You know, most experimental ecologists are working on relatively few species or in a single site or maybe across a, a gradient or, or something like that. Um, so we set out to ask how could we actually test these questions? Um, and we, we settled on looking at the global forest system. And this is for, for sort of two reasons. First off, we have really good compositional data of global forests due to things like a long history of national forest inventories. Um, we also have really good estimates of tree traits compared to a lot of other species. Really basic things like canopy measurements, uh, seed characteristics. These can be much more readily measured on trees, making it a really nice study system for looking at functional dispersion across different spatial scales. And then lastly, lastly we all, already have really sort of clear expectations for what sort of environments should be optimal, like you know, tropical, subtropical rainforests, down to dry Mediterranean forests or, or boreal forests as well. So using sort of the global forest system, we wanted to ask this question, where and how do species survive by being similar or dissimilar? So, so where does community assembly essentially limit or promote um, diversity among uh, coexisting individuals? And again, secondarily, maybe, maybe we can look at where the abiotic and biotic processes dominate, but I think that's a little riskier. Um, however, in some cases, as I'll talk about with respect to certain traits, we can make pretty clear assumptions about what is going on. Um, so to do this, we're combining two global data sets. So the first is the GFBI data set. This is the Global Forest Biodiversity Initiative. Uh, it's over 1.2 million forest plots all across the globe, over 30 million tree level measurements. Um, and what's really powerful about it, again, is it's, it's true um, absolute abundance data. We have um, tree diameter, tree height. We have really robust measurements to give us a, a really sort of unprecedented snapshot of community composition at the scale. 
Now, the second thing we need are traits. And we obviously don't have measurements for every trait in every location. So we can impute these uh, using the tri plant trait database, which is again, tens of millions of plant measurements, not just trees, but herbaceous plants as well. Um, for, for the full analysis, we focus on 30 different functional traits. Today, I'm just gonna talk about nine of them. And we can actually um, estimate traits with, with fairly high accuracy. So using machine learning models, a combination of phylogeny and environmental variables, we have about a 70% accuracy in predicting traits, which for our purposes is fine because we have, you know, with, with over a million plots, we have such high statistical power that, that we can sort of overcome any of the noise due to trait mismatch. Um, so the general approach, we combine GFBI, we combine TRI, and then we're gonna calculate functional dispersion for each plot at varying sampling scales. So these sampling scales define a different size of the regional species pool. And not just ask what is the functional dispersion of the plot, but ask how this functional dispersion changes uh, as we move across these scales. So I don't wanna make this a, a talk about null models, but I'll just give you a quick idea of, of how we actually go about doing this. So we, we pick a focal plot from GFBI. So here we have seven, seven different plots. This red one is our focal plot. Maybe it has five different tree species in it. Um, again, we're not just doing presence absence. We're actually looking at the abundances of species too. From this, we have the imputed traits for, eat, for every species in that location. So a mixture of leaf, wood, root, seed, crown traits, um, really whatever we think is, is um, being selected on both either by biotic or abiotic processes. And then you can use your, your favorite functional diversity metric. Um, for, throughout this analysis, we use Rouse quadratic entropy, uh, in part just because it, it's been shown to have really high statistical power to disentangle biotic from abiotic filtering. Now we need some sort of no model randomization here. So again, this is depends on the regional or, or the size of the species pool. So we can start off at the hyperlocal scale. We, we draw a 10 meter radius around the plot. We pick up one new plot and that plot has two new species in it. So now we have a total species pool of seven species. We do a standard uh, randomization where we hold the number of species fixed and we also hold the relative abundance distribution fixed. Um, in part because we want to tease apart the, the precise role of functional trait diversity from other things like uh, just overall diversity. And even though Rouse quadratic entropy is relatively insensitive to richness, uh, a lot of these functional trait metrics uh, really can vary heavily depending both on richness and abundance distributions. So to a thousand randomly sampled communities, for each one of these, we're just shuffling the trait matrix essentially, we're just shuffling traits at random. Um, and we can calculate this null functional diversity distribution across these 1,000 randomly sampled communities. Then to estimate dispersion, it's just um, an estimate of the empirical p-value. So we, we compare our null model to our actual observed functional diversity at this plot. And we see that, for example, here it's greater than 96% of the simulations. And therefore, our functional dispersion is going to be 0.96. And we can actually do this for increasing sampling radius. So here we have 10 meters, then maybe we've got to 100 meters. We have a new null model randomization. We get a new functional dispersion value. We zoom out to one kilometer and so on and so on. Um, and what I'm gonna talk about today goes out to 250 kilometers, uh, right around 300,000 um, square kilometers. Now we can do this not just for each individual plot, but every single plot, we can do this null model randomization. Um, it ends being over 25 trillion null model randomizations for this data set. So it's um, computationally a fun thing to work on as well as um, sort of theoretically. Um, actually, before I go on, does anyone have any questions about sort of this general approach at this point? Uh, I don't see any question uh, in the chat. Okay. So, um, yeah, just shoot something in the chat if, if you are unclear about this. Um, and this is this sort of null model approach is generally standard. The only difference is again how you choose the null model. You know, if you're doing something like neutrality, you might use a different type of null model. But the general principle, I'm certain all of you are, are somewhat familiar with. So let's look at some other results from this. Um, so what we'll get here are just the marginal curves of dispersion split out across six of the dominant forest biomes. Um, so across the the x-axis, we have sampling radius uh, going up to 250 kilometers. The y-axis is dispersion here. It's just scaled from one to minus one. So zero is no dispersion, essentially indistinguishable from the, the null distribution. A value of one is perfectly over dispersed. So maybe more biotic processes, but things are essentially very, very different than you would get at random. Minus one is things are very clustered, much more clustered than you would get if you sampled at random. 
And the first thing that jumps out when we look at this is that there's really consistent trends within some biomes, and there's some very different trends when we look across these different biomes. Um, so let's start here on the left-hand side, looking at boreal forests. Now, boreal forests, I've sort of been using them as my, my null hypothesis for suboptimal conditions. Um, and in fact, that's exactly what we see playing out, that in these systems, we see a clear, consistent signal of underdispersion. Um, at the most local scale, within the sort of meter scale, it's, there's essentially no signal, in part just because we're underpowered. But as we zoom out to about a kilometer, we see the this, this strong signal of clustering emerge, suggesting that things are more homogeneous, lower functional diversity than you would otherwise expect if you sampled at random. And this underdispersion just grows as you zoom out further and further. When we zoom over to something like the, the um, tropical forests, we see the opposite. At local scales, we see a clear signal of overdispersion, and this is strongest, somewhat paradoxically, in the, in the dry broadleaf forest, which I'll, I'll talk about a bit more in a minute. Um, and this actually persists for relatively large sampling scales. So it's not until we go out to about 20 kilometer sampling radius in the tropical dry broadleaf forest that we see the system flip over to um, sort of habitat filtering emerging as the dominant structure in the forest. In tropical moist, it's maybe a little bit less, it's about one kilometer. And then when we look at these temperate systems, they tend to fall somewhere in between. Temperate broadleaf, we still see over dispersion, but a much flatter curve. And the tropical forests just have much higher variation overall, in part because both well, temperate coniferous and tropical coniferous really encompasses a lot of different plant strategies and also has relatively low species richness. Um, the other thing to, to notice, which I'm sure all of you picked up on, that the, the rate at which this drops from over to under is much stronger in these, these tropical forests than in the boreal. And part of that is just the diversity of these systems. As we move out to and pick up new plots in tropical systems, we're picking up new species much more rapidly. Um, whereas in the boreal forest, it, it's much more homogeneous and it's enormous. And so zooming out 250 kilometers, you're still in a boreal forest and it looks very similar to your plot. So we could scale this x-axis perhaps on like the, the proportion of new species and maybe um, make this a little more uniform. But this really shows how quickly you have this turnover in community as you sample out. Now to get back sort of to, to the key idea of this workshop, what does this tell us about the mechanisms sort of in quotes that provoke survival and, and I'd say sort of coexistence, but coexistence in a meta community framework? Well, the boreal forest again is the, the easiest thing to think about species survive by being similar no matter what. So sort of similarity is the overarching principle that governs survival in these systems. Whereas when we look at to some of to these um, ecoregions that have this transition point, it varies. If you're looking at small scales, then species survive by being dissimilar. At a certain point, there's this inflection point where actually the mechanism governing survival flips and we move from dissimilarity to, to similarity. This is what I think is sort of, to me, the most compelling uh, and sort of profound part of this, this type of work. Thinking back to what we, we talked about yesterday when we were, um, there was some debate over the role of triads and these intransitive loops and the, the difficulty saying is, you know, transitivity really governing coexistence or is it just there independent? Um, and I actually think the problem is a bit deeper than that. It, it's that there is no such thing as one thing ensuring species survive. That this to some extent is always going to be scale dependent. Um, you know, if, if you zoom out to, 50 kilometers, for example, what this is saying is that survival, whether or not species can coexist, you can predict at least a first order approximation just based on how similar they are and dissimilar they are. It has nothing to do with dynamics. You know, eventually that takes over, but that's not what we need to know if we're dealing with these larger areas. Um, and as you zoom across this sampling radius, the, the so-called mechanism is actually shifting based on the focal scale at which you're, you're operating. Now, to go back to Viher and Ketty's first um, series of questions, they say functional diversity is great, but you really need to look at traits. And in fact, looking at traits gives us a much more interesting and nuanced view. So here we have the boreal forest and the tropical moist, and this is the individual trait dispersion for nine of these traits. Um, so the boreal forest was consistently under dispersed, which we see for a lot of traits, with the exception of crown height and root depth. For crown height, we just see really, really strong under dispersion. Essentially, no matter, um, what scale you look at, things have to be as similar with respect to crowns as possible. And again, this makes sense from a, a biological perspective that if you have different crowns, if you stick out too far, you're increasing risk of frost and, and wind damage. But if you don't have a big enough crown, you are also, um, you, you sort of have less photosynthetic capacity than you otherwise need to be competitive in those systems. 
However, when we look at something like root depth, even though overall functionally, functional diversity was underdispersed, we see a really strong signal of overdispersion and presumably competition with respect to these below ground processes. And again, this makes sense in the boreal forest. Below ground um, conditions are much less uh, variable. They're relatively optimal compared to above ground. And so although above ground is saying everything is as similar as possible, we actually see below ground things are as different as possible. So we actually can see how this process governing survival splits based on above versus below ground mechanisms simply by looking at these different traits. Um, and again, if, if you knew nothing about coexistence theory and I gave you a handful of a species in the boreal forest and said, could these survive together? Just based on this, you could start to make a, some basic assumption about whether or not species could coexist relative to another handful of species simply by looking at their functional trait diversity and uh, above versus, versus below ground traits. Um, when we look at the, the, the tropical moist broadleaf forest, we see, although it was overdispersed, we now see why perhaps it was sort of attenuated. Some traits are really strongly overdispersed. Some traits are actually strongly underdispersed. So things like leaf phosphorus, leaf phosphorus, root depth, specific leaf area, a lot of these, these things with like the leaf economic spectrum that we would expect to be indicative of competition, we see strong nutrient above and below ground diversification in these systems. But this also shows that the challenge of saying when we see over dispersion or under dispersion, we see you know, uh, the importance of biotic versus abiotic. Presumably what we're actually seeing here with leaf area is not the role of abiotic conditions being too stressful with respect to leaf area, but almost certainly this is a signal of hierarchical competition. Um, so leaf area is basically directly correlated with your photosynthetic capacity, your ability to grow tall, to outcompete other species. And so it's linear or, or at least correlated strongly with competitive ability. And so things are under dispersed because in order to survive in the tropics, you have to have large leaves with the exception of some specific mi microsites where maybe there are some trade-offs necessary. When we look at something like stem conduit diameter, we're seeing the same basic idea and this reflects this trade-off between moisture stress and moisture uptake. Um, you know, if you have really thin conduits to, to prevent sort of cavitation under drought conditions, this really affects your ability to keep stomata open, to be photosynthetically active. And so you're essentially penalized in these tropical conditions if you have really small stem conduit diameters because you limit your photosynthetic capacity. So when we break it out by individual traits, we actually really start to get an idea for how, for, sorry, for, for how species are competing and uh, the mechanisms they're using to interact with each other. Um, does anyone have any questions at this point? Yes, there are a couple of questions uh, in the chat which are about around the same thing. So the question is, uh, in summary, uh, if you could explain again how the null model uh, was built. And uh, in particular, um, I think that the question is about what is the pool of species. So you take this local area and you compare yep. the of traits with some randomization. So which traits, functional traits, and which species go into this randomization? Yeah, so okay, so the, the first thing um, to answer is, so the, the metric we use, um, we, we use this Rouse quadratic entropy, which is essentially mean pairwise distance. So we look at the, the mean pairwise distance, um, we normalize all the traits, so they're sort of all scaled to have the same units, um, and we just get the mean pairwise distance in this nine dimensional trait space. Um, and then we compare that mean pairwise distance to the average mean pairwise distance when we randomize across all different traits. Um, and we use a p-value, this empirical p-value, but you could use z-scores. There's a bunch of different ways and it, it really doesn't matter much, much how you do it. Um, the, the second question of how do we actually pick up new species? And this is conditional on, uh, let me go back to a figure real quick. So this is actually conditional on the, the plots located near that, that plot. So let's go to smaller. So here we have some, some focal plot. We specify 100 meter radius. And then we include in our null model all of the, the species that occur within plots within that 100 meter radius. Um, so if, if in some cases, if, if there's a plot that has nothing around it, we only use that plot for one point in, this, in the, those plots. So we, we, we don't just you know, sort of keep duplicating that value unless we pick up a new species at a different scale. And th this sort of touch upon, touches upon one of the big challenges is that this is conditional on the data. And almost certainly we are undersampling rare species in, in these systems. And presumably we're, we're undersampling them most strongly in places like the tropics. Um, and potentially this could also be why we're seeing this sort of attenuation. We, we would have expected to see massive over dispersion in the tropics, 
Um, but in fact, we're seeing sort of less than we would have thought. And in part, that could just be because we're not really adequately um, capturing the true diversity, the true set of species in that regional species pool that were excluded. Uh, in part, because if, if you're excluded, you know, often as seedlings, you could be quite rare in these systems. And these forest inventories often have like a five or 10 centimeter diameter cutoff. So if you're just a seedling or a small tree, you're going, going to be excluded from that system. Um, Hopefully that at least gives a, gives a, a rough idea, uh, but feel free to, to answer any follow-up questions. Um, actually, I saw one just come in. How, how are the randomizations done? Um, yeah, so the, the randomizations where we keep the, the, what they call the community matrix, not to be confused with the sort of stability community matrix, but they keep this matrix of abundance, richness, constant, and we shuffle the, the trait values across species. Um, so we're, we're conditioning on species abundances when we do these randomizations. Okay. And the, uh, the idea there is to, to make sure we're disentangling differences in richness from differences in, in functional diversity. But I guess the question is, when you take these community metrics and you have this list of species and you, are, you say you randomize the uh, functional trait associated, associated with the trait associated with species, so you randomize within what pool of species? So you take all the species at the global scale, or you take all the species in boreal forests and you randomize their traits within the boreal forest, or you take all the species within uh, a certain region and you randomize the traits among the species within that region. Yeah, exactly. So, so what we're doing is we're saying, like for this point, let's say like the first point here in the tropical moist broadleaf forest, this is the randomization involving all for, for each plot, we, this is sort of actually an aggregate curve taken across you know, tens of thousands of plots. For each plot, we do a separate randomization for that plot, including only the species within 10 meters of that plot. Mm -hmm. And so every single plot has its own null model distribution that starts off with all the species located within 10 meters and we do a randomization. Then for that same plot, we zoom out a little bit larger and we do all the species contained within one kilometer of that plot. Um, so by the time we get, if we zoom this out to you know a, a sampling radius of a, a thousand kilometers, that would be doing a randomization across all traits at the global scale. Um, but here we're only randomizing across species that are nearby to that plot and in growing increasingly far away from that plot. Mm -hmm. I hope that that answers it. I'm not sure if I. So just just to be sure, then we can move on. But so basically, this would be equivalent to shuffle the abundances of uh, the species that are present within that plot keeping the function, the, the trait uh, constant. Yep, that's another, another way thing. We, we keep our trait matrix constant and we are just, so we, we have this big trait matrix of all species that occurs within a region. And then we just randomly shuffle that abundance distribution for that plot across this, okay. this trait matrix. Okay. So, yeah. And, and th there are different ways to do it. Some people destroy the, the correlations among traits, um, but that generally doesn't change much. Here, here we're assuming you know, we're, we're keeping each species and its set of traits constant. We never break those up. So we're, we're sort of keeping implicit trade-offs and correlations among traits connected within this null model approach. Okay. I think, uh, yeah, we can move on. Okay. Um, so let's see. Yeah, so I, I think this sort of goes in a little bit, at, at least with respect to um, so, sort of some of the other processes that might be operating here. So. Um, when, when we look at these sort of patterns, there's these weird little artifacts that emerge. So in many of these, we see this initial low spot and the sort of peak that happens at, you know, one or five kilometers outward. Um, in other cases, they just sort of hover right around zero. And this is a bit related to what I talked about here. There's the sort of suppression of functional diversity, even though tropical moist is generally the most optimal for tree species, we see that the, the dispersion essentially sort of tamped down towards, towards zero. Um, and this is because sort of as I hinted at, I'm sure a lot of you think about, there's actually another process going on here, a presumed process, which is th that of neutrality in these systems. And when we zoom in really, really far, when we essentially look just within a, a plot, or we maybe move a few meters over, we pick up a plot right next door, we're really only adding one species. We're getting, we have really no statistical power to really see what's going on in that species pool. And so we're maybe essentially seeing a signal neutrality just as an artifact. Um, and this is sort of Jonathan Chase really put this nicely in this little diagram showing that as you move in, zoom in closer and closer and closer, you move away from niche processes until you've sort of removed all niche sorting and you're just looking at the signal of neutrality. 
And also in these tropical forests, that's where we would expect neutrality to be strongest, or at least that's where the idea of neutrality emerged, specifically looking through the idea of functional redundancy. Um, so, so our hypothesis for why the tropical moist is sort of tamped or, or sort of uh, biased towards zero compared to tropical dry is that tropical dry are often typified by these really strong wet and dry seasons. There's really strong niche partitioning, temporal niche partitioning, and there's um, much less opportunity for things to be truly neutral. Right? You know, you, you sort of have to be optimized to one scenario or another. Whereas in these tropical moist, every, there's essentially everything is always good. And so potentially this is just a, a greater signal of neutrality playing out here. Um, and so when we look at these curves that sort of rise and peak at some point, that peak gives us sort of the maximal scale, the optimal scale at which we can distinguish competition. And as we zoom in closer, we're moving just like Jonathan Chase showed away from niche processes more towards these stochastic or, or neutral processes. Um, and I, I, this isn't quite along the lines of this workshop, but just to show you, I've been looking at marginal trends in part because they really illustrate the, these ideas really clearly, but we can do some more true statistics and modeling beneath the scenes. Um, so we can sort of control for environmental variables, we can control for human activity, for soil conditions, and try to understand how dispersion varies across um, these, different, uh, these different environmental gradients. When we do this, sampling area comes out as the strongest predictor, just as we saw as you zoom out, things always tend to go down. And we know at the global scale, a, a, a boreal forest is very different than a tropical forest. And so sampling area must be the biggest predictor. But we also see some things like solar radiation, precipitation seasonality, temperature seasonality, uh, precipitation of the driest month, as well as some soil conditions, which we know matter for uh, tree growth, like soil organic carbon, cation exchange capacity. Um, so this starts to inform what are the gradients that really define optimal versus suboptimal in these environments. Um, and not to, to go into it too much detail, but just to give you an idea of what we can get out of this so we can actually fit the model, the marginal model predicted curves. So here we have high solar radiation, low solar radiation. And we see there's this dual interaction between radiation and solar organic carbon. So if you're in you have high solar radiation, essentially near the equator, we see the significant interaction with solar organic carbon that governs over versus under dispersion. But when you move to more solar radiation areas, again, more towards the poles, we now see that there's much less of an effect of soil organic carbon. So in other words, we can say that solar, soil radi solar radiation is sort of the primary limiting factor. And once this primary limiting factor is alleviated, soil organic carbon emerges as a secondary limiting factor. Um, so this is just a hint of some of the other things that, that we can get out of this as well. Um, sort of just in the sake of time, I'll, I'll skip that last slide and move on to some of the, the things, more applied questions that we can do in this. So again, not really for, for what we're talking about today, but we can actually do some really cool and interesting things. So we can fit a curve for each plot, not just the marginal curve, but fit a curve to each plot, each, each plot sort of dispersion curve across sampling area. And we can make a map, for example, of the slope, uh, the x-intercept, sort of that transition point, the y-intercept, what the maximum dispersion might be or the minimum dispersion. Um, and just to give you an example, so this is global functional dispersion at one kilometer level. And I mean, it looks a lot like functional diversity apart from some of these more interesting things. You know, it's not the Amazon basin that necessarily has the highest functional dispersion, even though it might have the highest functional diversity, but it's some of these areas like uh, Southeast Asia and Indonesia, where we have, again, these really typified by wet and dry seasons, monsoon seasons, where we see really strong niche partitioning that is driving higher functional dispersion. And the lowest functional dispersion actually ends up being in these, these drier regions, you know, like parts of Australia, um, and then moving up into the boreal forest as well. So this is just an example of the types of sort of applied questions we can, we can do here. Um, so just to wrap up, um, I, I, what I think is really useful about this, first off, we can look at these overarching principles governing survival, similarity versus dissimilarity, which we don't really think of through coexistence, but I think I would argue it's maybe one of the, the sort of key overarching principles at the global scale when we think of these communities. So I'd be eager to chat a bit more about that. Maybe we can get at assembly processes, but I think that again, is a bit more dubious unless you really look at individual traits. Um, and then for some of these more applied questions, we can look at the environmental drivers governing this as well as which traits are most sensitive to these, these drivers. Um, and then as I alluded to before, I, I think the, the most interesting thing about this and what I'd be interested to chat more about is how this illustrates that these mechanisms for coexistence are very context dependent. Um, on the one hand, we know this, if we think of like a patch occupancy model, we know the criteria for stability is not the same as stability within a community. Um, 
but I think it also really questions what we mean when we, what we're, when we talk about coexistence. And if we zoom in so close that we're looking at coexistence within a single closed community, is that really indicative of these true processes that, or what governs at least survival, long-term persistence of species at the global scale? Um, and with that, I'd like to, to thank my funding sources. Again, thank the, the um, organizers for today. Thank all of you for listening. And just a, a shameless plug, um, I'm hiring a postdoc. So if any of you are interested or know a colleague who's looking for a postdoc position in really anything theoretical, it's, it's quite broad, um, feel free to, to get in touch. Um, and with that, thanks again. And I'm happy to, to answer some official questions. Thanks, Ben. So the, uh, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, there are uh, a couple of questions. So Mercedes had a question. So um, if you want to ask it, and uh, yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Very very interesting talk. Um, one question that I think is of relevance is these data sets largely have uh, traits that uh, relate to demography. And there was a very interesting paper on uh, from data from the from the sites uh, in Panama, from the famous uh, forest yes. sites in Panama, where they showed that uh, if you are looking for traits that influence the frequency dependent, negative frequency dependent interactions that underlie uh, some of the hypotheses for coexistence in the rainforest, because they are the ones that may underlie both uh, niche formation and some form of balance in selection, um, then and coevolution, then the, the, the traits that seem to matter the most were traits that had to do, for example, with the chemistry of the leaves and not with the demography. So they were completely orthogonal traits to the traits related. And these Somehow, may it's uh, the question I had is a lot of the traits in these data, as, as I said, they have to do with demography and competition along an axis where you want to be more similar or more neutral to coexist. Whether you know you need some form of negative frequency dependent selection, which this this kind of effect of distance is very reminiscent of the Janssen Connell hypothesis operating nearby for which many of the chemical traits may be important. Yeah, I, I think this is, I think raised a, a really sort of good point. I mean, I, I'm sort of saying like these are different processes, but when we're talking about something like limiting similarity, we're really talking about niche differentiation. And in, in effect, we're talking about the role of intraspecific self-regulation, these negative feedbacks that, that are driving this here. And so in a way, when we see this really strong um, sort of pushing apart in trait space of species, this is some, to some extent suggesting that there is some sort of negative uh, density dependence operating in these systems. Um, but I also think that the demographic traits is, is a, really, a really interesting idea. And I think when we, going back to the slide, actually I can pull it up, where we talk about um, hierarchical competition, in a sense, what we're talking about are traits that are sort of demographic, can be re related to demographics in some way. And we see different selection operating on something like leaf phosphorus, which is true niche, it's sort of nutrient differentiation. Um, presumably root depth is also a similar thing. They're accessing very yeah. different nutrients. Um, we do look at things, we also, I didn't include them here, but we can look at above ground biomass, maximum tree growth rate. Um, and those things are, are generally under dispersed as you would expect. Like if you're in the tropics, you have to be able to grow big in order to survive. And so, some of these demographic traits map exactly what we would expect to see. Um, and, and I think what I sort of like about this and, and part of this is um, when we're dealing at these scales, there's this, I, I really enjoy working with patterns more and more because we know these patterns are driven by some underlying dynamical process that's operating. Um, but obviously we can't go to every place and measure, you know, apart from these really rigorous studies like in Panama, you can't necessarily measure long-term growth. Um, and so the patterns, they're suggestive, but again, they give us some nice insight that I think really maps on to what, what you've mentioned, um, that we see the split by demographic versus nutrient competition in these systems. There was a question from uh, Miguel Rodriguez. Ah, hello, uh, Neil, thank you. That was, that was a, that's really cool uh, work. I, I have uh, two very minor questions towards the end. You, you, you had uh, some uh, potential predictors of that dispersion uh, from the different environments. 
Uh, yeah. But I, I noticed you were measuring their strength with R squared, but then the solar radiation was clearly nonlinear. The effect of solar radiation, well, I shouldn't say the effect, but the, the correlation between solar radiation yeah, yeah. and the dispersion was clearly non um, Could that be hiding some important uh, predictors that uh, uh, maybe they, they are tightly correlated with, with the uh, dispersion, but in, not in a linear way uh, for, for the others that, that had low, low values? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So the, half the reason we use um, random forests is just because these things are incredibly nonlinear. And it, at random forest, it's, it's prone to overfitting a bit, but um, I would rather, it, it's unbiased with respect to the shape of the functional form that you assume. Um, you know, you, we can fit a linear model and maybe we can extrapolate a bit better, but we're going to be wrong everywhere a little bit. Um, but to your question about R squared, so I should have been a bit more clear. So this is actually like, you might call it the coefficient of determination. It's essentially, the normalized mean squared error. So we just plot observed versus predicted, and it's just the, the square of the standard deviation divided by the overall standard deviation. Um, so it's not fitting a line. We're not doing a regression. Yeah, we're just comparing observed to predicted. Um, and, and okay, I do that, think, like, that makes a lot more sense. Thank you. Yeah, and I like, you know, the, it's still relatively high. And I do think, like, of course, there has to be huge variation in part because, you know, people, like, even though human footprint isn't a great predictor, part of that is because somewhere like in Europe where we have these forest inventory data, everything has a human footprint of essentially one, you know, it's a hundred percent human footprint. Um, and so when we go back long enough, this, hum this idea that humans are disturbing this or just creating noise is going to significantly drop these a little bit. Um, but yeah, it's a good question, thanks. If, if I can ask just a, an unrelated, very quick one, uh, is, there, is there a way to control in these, uh, in these kind of models? Uh, have you addressed the problem of relatedness between the, the species? You have evaluated the traits, uh, but some of these effects might just be the byproduct of having very closely related species or very distant related species uh, in the same plots. Uh, yeah, is so there a way that's to control for that? Um, yeah, that, it's a good question. I'm not certain how to control for it. We, we do a, an analogous um, uh, randomization where we look at phylogenetic diversity. So we use mean phylogenetic distance. Um, I didn't show it because it's a little more complex because when you start to zoom out even closely, if we think of something like the tropics, there's been a long history of um, more rapid evolution compared to more poleward systems where the glaciers sort of scraped them and now they're slowly starting to recolonize. So the, the trends are a lot more complex in part because when we zoom out even to 100 kilometers or something reasonable, we're really seeing these evolutionary processes start to govern these patterns much more quickly than we see true competition among things. Um, but to your same extent, it could be that what we're seeing is trait differences might just be this neutral trait that has no selective pressure and is, again, just a byproduct of a, you know, some sort of adaptive radiation somewhere along the lines in history. Um, I, I, it's actually a really interesting point. We, we haven't thrown this into a predictor. Like we, we could certainly throw it into these models and look at something like evolutionary diversification or, or you know, minimize pairwise distance or something like that and try to see controlling for environmental conditions and controlling for evolutionary history. Do we still see traits come out? It, it would be a, a cool way to get at the relative importance of traits in biology. So yeah, it's a nice idea. <laughs>